Great. Um, welcome everyone to our Bunky Clinic uh, virtual visiting professor series. Um, today we have the distinct honor of, of uh, having Dr. Larry Gottlieb, um, who is a professor of surgery and plastic surgery at the University of Chicago. Um, he is a director of, of a burn and complex wound center as, as well. Um, and uh, Dr. Gottlieb really needs no introduction. He uh, is the immediate uh, past president uh, of the American Society for Reconstructive Microsurgery, um, and he really is an, is an internationally renowned expert in many things, some of which are complex head and neck reconstruction, uh, burn reconstruction, which we will be discussing today, specifically with regards to microsurgery, uh, genital urinary reconstruction, and really complex reconstruction from head to toe. I mean, he, there's not much that Dr. Gottlieb does not do. We've, um, I, I've had the personal privilege of visiting Dr. Gottlieb's team um, twice over the last few years. This was, I believe, in 2017, um, and this was more recent last year during my, uh, uh, my, my, my travels. And, um, and he and his team at, at Chicago have, have always been extremely uh, gracious and, and hospitable. Um, so it's, it's, been a, it's been a really a, a pleasure uh, to get, get to know him better and, and also his team at the University of Chicago. Um, I never trained personally with Dr. Gottlieb, but I, I feel that I have, um, I have learned um, more from him than I have from some people who, who have worked with personally. I think throughout, I mean, even though, even with the, the so-called disasters of the masters a few years ago, I think everything that he does and everything he talks about is just uh, full of educational pearls. And so I, I want to thank you again, Dr. Gottlieb, for being here with us, and we're greatly looking forward to your talk. And it looks like we actually have people from all over the world on this uh, on this talk, so clearly there's a lot of interest here. Um, I'm going to hand you control now, and you can share your desktop in just a minute. Great. Yeah, can you see me? Um, I can see you. Great. And if, I'm going to ask everyone to keep your microphones and your webcams off, and I'll do the same until the end of the talk. Thanks so much, Larry. Go ahead. So, uh, Bobby, do you want to, if there's questions, I don't know if you want to interrupt or wait till the end, people use chat, or if you can. Yes. Yeah, so most, people, most people type their questions in the chat box, and so I'll ask them at the end. Um, and then in the end, some people will turn their microphones on and ask directly as well. Okay. Uh, so we won't interrupt you during the talk. Can you see this uh, other stuff on the window here? Um, I, we only see the PowerPoint and your mouse oh. as well. So that's good. Okay, because I see all this other crap. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me see if this thing is working. There we go. Uh, I have, unfortunately, no financial conflicts of interest. And I want to thank Babak and Bunky Clinic for inviting me to this virtual Grand Rounds. Um, I've had 36 years of a combination of reconstructive microsurgery and burn care. Uh, and people ask, you know, what percentage is your reconstructive stuff? What percentage is your burn stuff? And the answer is almost always 100 and 100. So I'm usually running two or three rooms simultaneously three, four days a week, uh, and in one room I'll have a burn, another room I'll have a micro, another room I'll have another uh, plastic surgery case. Uh, so we do a lot of it together, and it really is, if you call it, I don't know, 48 hours, work weeks have doubled. And so I'm gonna talk pretty much on principles and concepts and thoughts and perspectives and it's not all going to be microsurgery because uh, microsurgery is uh, not necessarily in the forefront of burn reconstruction. Uh, and I'm going to show you where it's good and where it may not be so good and what alternatives we have. And these are uh, some of the main things, our goals and perspectives. And uh, assuming we have a spectrum of uh, people in the audience, just we'll deal with some basic stuff. And then uh, get on to a little bit more uh, advanced thought process. And some basic stuff, just to be sure on the same page, terminology, contraction, we all know is the body pulling the tissues together by, we think, the myofibroblasts. And then the word contracture is that fixed part once the joint can't move uh, that limits it. 
And it's important to think about intrinsic contractures and extrinsic contractures. This intrinsic contracture you see of this neck, and then when she lifts her head up, the cheek comes down and she has an ectropion, whereas her neck is down, you can see over here that the, uh, she does not have an ectropion. Clearly, prevention is always better than treatment in these diseases. Here again, uh, there's an extrinsic contracture, or intrinsic in her uh, neck, and extrinsic in her lip. As she pulls the head up, everything gets pulled. And you need to be able to sort that out because releasing the neck here obviously would help the lip significantly, although the lip has some problems as well. And when we think about burn reconstruction in general, it's really modulation of scars. And it begins with the acute care of burn uh, patients and their wounds. And we go from there to the rehabilitative phase and then the reconstructive phase. But early closure of the burn wound and appropriate positioning and splinting uh, will obviate many, many of the problems uh, that we have down the road. The kind of people we take care of in the burn center has thermal burns, chemical, electrical, frostbite. And then there's a group of patients we call burn equivalents which is the desquamating diseases like TENS, toxic epidermolysis, neptizer fasciitis, complex wounds, road rash, and peripheral fulminans. If you notice on my title, it's the, we call our unit the burn and complex wound center, so nobody gives us a hard time about dealing with these other patients. Now, when you think about thermal burns, it's rare that we need preflops in acute thermal burns. Except, of course, in situations where you might have vital structures, tendons, or joints, or bones exposed. But even then, with the development of uh, biologic matrices and the freestyle perforated flaps, all of a sudden we don't need free flaps so much because I can cover almost everything, either with a little perforated flap, even if it's scarred already, or uh, some integra and a skin graft. Now, electrical injuries are another story. Electrical injuries, we, we haven't seen in a long time. We used to have a, a lot of them. Uh, they're very, very devastating injuries, especially the high voltage injuries. And I don't know if you guys uh, see much of this at all anymore, but I feel strongly uh, that if you want to salvage maximum tissue, you need to emergently decompress them because they all develop quantum syndromes, at least if it gets involved in the extremities. Uh, early debris month, uh, of all the clearly devitalized or charred tissue, and then coverage within a few days. And actually, we reported a number of years ago where we have marginal muscle that we biopsy at the time, cover it with a free flap, come back a number of months later when we're doing a secondary procedure, and rebiopsy, you can see recovering muscle. Uh, so long as it's not that dead, uh, you can salvage a lot if you can cover it with healthy tissue. And we do that as soon as possible. I don't believe in the repeat, repeat debris months, because so I think you just lose more tissue. That can be a discussion itself. This guy had a, uh, uh, was a lineman. Uh, he had uh, a mental flap, we have to debris for his arm, and at the same time, a rectus flap on his face, and a uh, gastric flap for his knee, all in the same day, uh, which all got him covered and out of this acute phase, and then we just take care of his ICU issues. Frostbite, uh, you probably don't see much. Uh, we see a lot with the polar vortex in uh, Chicago. And um, the first thing I can't did when I came to Chicago was uh, saw these uh, people with all these dead fingers and stuff, and this old adage that Bob Parsons taught me, which was uh, freeze in January and amputate in July. And that seemed crazy to me. So we, in the last 30 years or more, uh, have set up algorithms and programs to try to salvage limb length. Uh, and you can read about all this, since I assume we're not going to be doing most frostbite stuff. Purple fulminans is another thing that we've seen a lot of. And again, uh, early decompression of the compartments have been pretty well shown uh, that you can save length and then free flaps to salvage knees uh, and upper extremity length uh, that, uh, so that you can uh, help with prostheses. This uh, was a significant part of the Bunky lecture that I gave at 2018 ASRM. Now, getting back to the, uh, the burn per se, uh, 
all visible burn scars have a quantitative loss and or a qualitative loss. It's important in your mind to sort of figure out what do you need? Do you need more tissue or you just need to resurface the tissue? The quantitative loss is loss of functional tissue. Here you can see there's, you need more tissue in almost all these things. They're all, it's all from the scar contractures. Contraction that leads to the contractures. And then there's the qualitative loss, which there's no loss of range of motion uh, in this or, whoop, or in the hand. Uh, but there's qualitative differences. And then there's the combination, such as in the upper uh, picture there. Our goals are not necessarily to make beautiful people, though it would be nice, but really our main goal is to make people function beautifully. And more frequently than not, most quantitative burn reconstruction entails releasing burn scar contractions, either with intrinsic or extrinsic uh, contract releases. So with the incisional release, you're incising the scar, you're just cutting the scar. If you will, you're lengthening the line and you're interposing more skin. So here's the line that is too short. And you want to lengthen that line so it doesn't grow like, go like the crow's flies. And the hard part is trying to figure out pre-op, when you make that incision, how much is that going to pop open? How much skin do you need? And the next question is, what kind of skin do you put in there uh, to hold that and maintain that? So the options, of course, are all the same options that you all know. Skin grafts, uh, local flaps, Z-plasties, regional flaps, distant flaps, and free flaps. And the question is, how do we figure it out? How do we decide which is which? And usually the most important thing you think about is contour, but you also want to think about all the other things, the color, the texture, the composition, and also the limitations, which is donor site availability. This is the torso of a 16-year-old kid who I took care of when he was two-year-old, burned with a 95% uh, uh, burn. He has, and most of it was down to fascia. He is growing out of his skin, and it is a major problem to release contractures and to find skin to put in there. The other thing that cannot be uh, uh, overstressed is thinking about the psychodynamics of the patient. In each group of these patients, you know, uh, Babak talked about, you know, the head and neck patients and the burn patients and the trauma patients, they all have different psychodynamics. And you need to learn that. You need to see what's important. And scars and putting more scars, and taking more donor site is very important to a lot of these patients. So this, uh, I hope you can see this, um, is, is a little quick thing I did many years ago. The red is the good, right? So the best thing is direct closing. Unfortunately, you can't do that very much. Serial excision works well, except you get a wide scar. Skin grafts never look good. Uh, as good as, when I say never looks good, never looks normal, normal. Full thickness skin grafts may be a little bit better. Uh, dermal substituting skin graft, uh, you're in between the skin graft and the full thickness graft. Local flaps are the best because it's like tissue. The closer you get to it, you are. Tissue expansion is the best because that's also local uh, tissue. Distant flaps and free flaps are not very good. They're great for bringing tissue in, for bringing volume in, and you get good quality. And if you have to fill a hole, fill the part, or uh, close the wound, that's fine. But if you want something to look good, especially on a, a face or a visible area, uh, it's not necessarily the best, particularly the color's off, and the thickness is frequently off, and you need to do multiple stages. And we'll talk about that. So this is an old case from uh, over 20 years ago, uh, just to show, give it, make a point. The 85% burn, he had a severe contracture of his neck. And we're going to talk about incisional release here. So you can see this is his mouth, this is his chin, here's his neck. And he's going to have just incisional releases. These are just uh, incisions that are made and everything just pops open. It's hard to predict how much that's going to be. One of the principles that I use is I like to get people. Uh, released, temporarily closed them with a graft uh, or some temporary closure, and then think about flap afterwards, just because your post-operative regimen is very different to maintain this slip up, to maintain this chin up, and everything else uh, with a graft versus a flap. 
And then the other important concept in uh, scar releases is the double fishtail, which I assume most of you should know. So if this is a scar, and you just make an incision, your release is going to be uh, ovoid. If this is a scar, and you do a double fishtail, you're going to get more of a rectangular release. So you get better uh, release on the edges rather than the center. So after closure with the skin graft, you have a good contour, and his lip is up. The problem is, if you use a skin graft, you have to splint it. You have to splint it for a good nine months for it to work, uh, at least part-time. And if you don't have a compliant patient or a dedicated OTPT, it's not going to work, and you have significant recurrence. Here, after a few months, in a very actually compliant patient, you see he's recurring, and he's uh, not very good. And there's, this was, uh, again, an 85% burn. He didn't have a lot left, but he had a little bit on his shoulders and the epaulet areas for his superclavicular flaps. Put some expanders in, expanders in his cheeks. And able to transpose those. And here he is 20 years later. Went to the Army, went to medical school, uh, and is a practicing physician right now. And you can see the advantage. I mean, he still has some red scars and his... Junction here is not quite in the middle, but the color match is better than any free flap and definitely better than a flap. Well, the rest of his body was all burnt and scarred anyway, so there was nothing else to introduce. So this is a frequent thing if you deal with kids, uh, especially kids under the age of two. They get these extrinsic, uh, con uh, these uh, extensive contractions of their toes. And uh, these are both quantitative and qualitative, and we we'll release them again with the zigzag and the fishtails and pin them. Another question is, what do you close them with? And you can use Integra, you can use skin graft, you can use both. And it tends to work, but it tends to recur. So the other thing I started doing was, uh, if it, if you have skin graft on fat, or well, definitely on dermis, but definitely even on fat, you can do little propeller flaps. Uh, that have been previously skin grafted. And then the advantage is that you move the flap over and the flap's not gonna contract because that, but then you put your full thickness skin graft here rather than your graft here, which will tend to contract. And it works quite well, because on both feet. And then there's an excision or release. And there's a similar type situation, but a recurrence actually is extrinsic and intrinsic contractors. And in this, we just cut it out and put a big free flap on it and get done with it. And it is uh, far better. So all you, everybody knows about indications for uh, flaps in general. I mean, it's the same in burns as any place else, to cover wounds, close structures, to build holes, fill holes, to build apart. And for free flaps in burn reconstruction, uh, it's when really local and regional tissue is not available or not appropriate, uh, because that's, again, going to be your best uh, tissue. Um, or if your pedicle flap is not long enough, you take that same pedicle flap and you can just move move that as a free flap. Uh, or large flaps that need uh, uh, augmented blood supply. So the limitations are regional flaps, of course, that the pedicle is not long enough. Uh, we sort of think of them as quicker than free flaps, but not necessarily, because the extirpation, whether it's head neck surgery or it's, it's burn, you, you can't do it simultaneously. That's in the same field. So you have to wait until one part is finished. Whereas if you're doing two teams, one person can do the uh, recipient part, one part the donor site. And then of course there's less versatility in providing volume of tissue and limited ability to high and sightly scars. So the limitations, of course, of microsurgery, which you guys don't have, is that you can't do it, you don't have it. But the real limitation everybody has is donor site availability. This is that kid that was two years old, that now is 20 years old, and is getting all these contractions and growing out of his skin. Um, and then donor site aesthetics and deformity, uh, and the patients get really upset when they have a big uh, new scar uh, because they're so psychologically averse to scars. And then, again, with burns and, and head and neck cancer and everything else, we really want to avoid distant tissue on the face. Uh, you use the thigh, use the belly. It always, the, the color's off, the texture's off. 
uh, and it's always distracting. In addition, the flaps, at least in Western people in Chicago, are all too fat. Now there's the acute thinning that Ogawa and Hakusoko uh, super thin, ultra thin flaps, sort of like your uh, Venus flaps, but on a giant basis. I'm not sure they're not full thickness graph. Uh, or you have to do it secondarily over many stages. Most of these cases, you need to think of it uh, as not as one operation, uh, but you need to think ahead uh, many steps so you can accomplish your goals. And as perceptions and expectations, I compare it to where you started. You usually have a really good result, and you want your patient to draw a little picture of where you started. But when we compare it to normal, uh, it's rarely quite there. So this is a patient uh, I took care of about 30 years ago. He came to me. Uh, he had been operated someplace else and had some preliminary reconstruction. So he had a skin graft here, composite, with the grafts going, the air going on the wrong way. He has a chin, uh, full thickness graft. He had mesh grafts on the neck. We should never do, you don't want to do mesh grafts on the face, on the neck, on the hands. Uh, and although his range of motion was okay, he really didn't like his neck. And that was his main complaint. And uh, it turned out that he had one circumferential area on his forearm that was not burned. He, probably slid up his sleeve with this explosion. And so we took that as a circumferential radio farm flap and resurfaced his uh, neck. Always do other little things. He had a notch in his nose from his tubes in his nose and we did a little turnover flap and cartilage grafts and he got his nose better. So here's his neck 15 years later after a couple of thinnings. The semen and array of form, they need to be thinned. And you say, what did we really accomplish? You see his nose is maintained over 15 years, and his neck is maintained. And the thing we really accomplished was getting him to shave his upside down mustache. Here's a guy who was uh, actually in prison, had a 70% burn. We excised him mostly to fascia, and but there was an area here that wasn't full thickness for some reason, and we left it. Uh, fortunately, that was uh, we did that because he ended up with his neck contracture and we had no tissue to use to release it. So we could take this as a, a DF flap based on the deep and fib gesture. The perforate is still there and put it on his neck as a free flap. Uh, needs a couple of thinnings and his donor site then is just a skin graft. This is a Sweet girl who had domestic violence or uh, significant other splashed uh, acid on her. She had these significant burns. Uh, they actually didn't look terrible, terrible, but she psychologically couldn't deal with them because partly because of uh, how they were inflicted. And we again did a super thin uh, uh, DM flap to her neck, tried to break it up. And uh, surprisingly good color match. But even with that and with breaking it up, she developed these uh, bands in the front and required some more Z-plasties and interdigitations to ultimately get that done. And here we go on a qualitative reconstruction. And of course, when we do this, we're dealing with little bits of the other stuff. We'll do Z-plasties, a little dermabrasion, or if people have lasers, they'll do lasers. And we'll do different things to get the rest of the scar is better as well. This is a more recent uh, case of a young girl who was in a house fire, and this was in 2016. She comes to see me about a year later. And you can see she, uh, the biggest problem, concern here is her neck. And she has a bunch of scars on her face, and this is still kind of early, and there is somewhat red. A different surgeon in town released her neck and put this skin graft in there. And it still doesn't look very pretty and she's still contracted. And she has intrinsic contractures, extrinsic contractures. And so we did a bunch of little Z-plasties. And what I'll frequently do with these patients is do small operations to see how well they deal with uh, the operations and the scars and everything psychologically, sort of as a test. 
And so over a year or two, this is what she looked like by the time she came to us. And our goal is to deal with that. Meanwhile, we'll put a tissue expander, which we're not leave talk about much here, but the uh, to get rid of this big patch scar in the belly. Um, and then for the neck, the question is, what's the best technique for resurfacing the neck? And uh, the next question is, where's the best place to harvest the skin for resurfacing the neck? And the third question is, how do you get that skin where you want it? And then the question is, how do you close the donor site? Again, somebody who's very uh, concerned about scars, trying to get rid of them rather than add them. So one of the things I don't like to do, I don't like to expand flaps. And the reason I don't like to expand flaps is that the, you can't predict the elastic recoil later over time. Frequently, it's about 20% uh, elastic recoil immediately, but then you can have a 20 or even 40% recoil over time that you don't quite realize. And my goal here was actually to put an expander uh, in our upper test, but to ultimately use the tissue here on the deltoid chromial a perforated flap, but not expand it and expand the donut set next to it to close it. Unfortunately, uh, what happened was the expander sort of shifted and went right under the flap and under the scar. And with that, actually, it increased uh, the tethering in our neck. The other thing that's really, really important when you're dealing with necks, which I assume everybody knows, is that you need to examine the patient before you go to sleep when they're sitting up and when they're laying down because it drapes differently, your neck crease is gonna be different places uh, and your planning will be different. And so you need to plan them up and down and up and down uh, so that you can do that in the operating room as well. So here we are in the operating room and um, we figure out where that anticipated crease is gonna be, which we marked sitting up. We have the edges of that scar. We have a full port here. And we open up a little bit. Now these are all incisioned, right? So nothing was taken out. Here we're incision again. You see how that wound just pops open. And um, then we have, here's a template of how much we need. And there's the anticipated pivot point, but recognizing if it doesn't reach, I will just divide it and use it as a free flap. This is a great little flap, it was a great pedicle. So I've pretty much gotten away from paper and used mostly three-dimensional, but this shows you pretty much what the size is here. And make an incision to confirm the presence of a perforator, which is gonna be here, about eight centimeters down, eight centimeters that way. And then an anterior incision. And then I have my three-dimensional uh, uh, template which then I can figure out the, the thickness of the flap and how it's gonna inset and that changes the size of the flap. Obviously if you have a thick flap with a thin uh, margin or vice versa. I put all, nothing blue in my expanders all the time, uh, which really helps for a lot of different reasons but we'll get into now. Uh, basically elevated that, here's our flap. I want you to notice how large that flap is and then what it looks like with time. The nice thing about this, we're assuming it's gonna be good color. And uh, there's the pedicle, the delta chromial perforator, which is, you'll see better in another case. But again, if it doesn't quite reach, you can't quite inset it right, you just get some recipient vessels out a little closer, uh, either transverse cervical, the facial, uh, and you can move it as a free flap. These techniques are all the same. When we do perforated flaps and free and, and uh, the free flaps, the only difference is the microanastomosis. So I sort of consider all this stuff microsurgery. And then we take the, one of the biggest problems with uh, burned chins is they get flat. So we took a fat flap and tried to fold it under to give her a little chin, close this up, be able to close the donor side because of that tissue expander. And you can see we have this nice large flap here, a little bit fattier here. Oh, wrong way. Here she's one day, here she's at one month. And now 
with time, look what's happening. This thing is tethering and it's narrower and it's about three quarters the size that it was. But we sort of anticipated that. And we, we thin this half and half. I don't like thinning with liposuction, especially in the neck, but I do it open. And the, we're gonna thin this part, we plan to lift it up. So we're gonna defat the left half. And then we're gonna isolate the pedicle. We're gonna flip the pedicle down. So uh, this way, so I can use it as a recipient vessel. And then I'm gonna move this up since this uh, slipped lower than we thought. I'm gonna transpose the flap up and then I'm gonna tighten the neck. And then I'm gonna to wanna to get rid of all this scar. So we're gonna do a deep that we're gonna then hook up to the deltochromial perforators that initially was taking care of this. Let me go back. So this pedicle used to come up here. Now it's going down here. It's gonna hook up to the uh, deep and we have this flap here, this flap here. And you can see uh, what we've done over a two year period. Now during this time, I don't do laser, but I sent it to Scott Holtman it, it didn't really make much difference. Most of the stuff get better on its own. Uh, but you can see there's still little adjustments that need to be made. She's too fat here. She's too fat there. She's too small here. You can see we've made great advantages on a trunk, although it still needs more. This is uh, the stuff you get from these patients where she's taking a selfie and pointing to the parts that need to be taken care of. And she's tethering again as she's getting smaller. Do a little fat grafting from this flap and putting it into the side chest wall and to the breast as well. Do a little flap within a flap here. So we found a little perforator and flip that down to move that uh, nipple over. So it's a lot of little flaps here, make a little nipple there. And there she is six months uh, after that. And there you can see a pretty much two year uh, follow up of where we're at. She still has a lot of scars. Feels better about her scars. She likes these scars with the big normal skin in between better than these scars. Look how big this got. I mean, this is this, is this plus whatever the donor site was there. We keep moving this neck back, try to get her that cervical mental angle which she doesn't naturally have very much. And then we do this, these are annuities, these cases, we're uh, working on our ear and serially excised this and other, other things. So here's another really, really difficult case of a young girl that was in, had a chemical explosion of chemical factory. And this is her mouth. And she allegedly had nothing done although somebody tried to do laser apparently. This was in 2016, so 616. It was right when I got sick actually, so I didn't see her for six months. This is pictures I got from her cell phone. And here she is six months later. We finally got back and it seems to have gotten worse and she swears nothing was done or she did anything. And so the question is, what do we do about this? Is there anything we can do uh, would non-surgical stuff help? Would less surgical stuff help? But I don't think it would. I think you should have to resurface all that. So typically, as I said, I like to in do incisional releases first, but I did this and there was no lip left. So um, I ended up taking as an excisional release in the aesthetic unit. In the lower lip, just did a fishtail incisional release. Another question is, what do you resurface that with? And one of the things I've been doing for many years is this uh, full thickness graft that maintaining the subdermal plexus. I don't know if you guys do that from Sukuda. 
1980. Uh, it's very similar, I think, to your Venus uh, flaps. Uh, here it is. Maintain that. Put a dressing on it. A week later, this has capillary refill. I mean, it is pretty amazing. It, you know, usually full thickness graphs are the purple and blue and crappy for a while on the top sloughs. This was uh, pink and uh, blanching at one week. Looks kind of crappy there. This was the donocyte, which was uh, the upper medial arm, which is a very good donocyte for color match to the face. And no matter how good that color match is, it still looks terrible with time and needs to have adjustments and be fine tuned. And uh, I defat this secondarily to get rid of the pooches underneath the grafts. Revise the edge of the, uh, bring the, the vermilion up. And then for the lower lip, which was not getting any better and didn't look very good, I basically decided to excise the whole thing. Uh, and then went to the chest again for that uh, gap flap. This is, uh, if you haven't done this, we wrote this up. This is, uh, it's a great vessel. Here you can, you'll see the vessel. Is uh, here's the perforator. The deltochromial branch is going this way. And you'll see we'll lift it up in a second when we pull up that uh, blue uh, vessel loop. Uh, there you go. So we're going to divide. We're going to divide it here, and then you have this whole thing here that goes right into the uh subclavian at the thoracochromial trunk you can take it as a chimeric with a piece of pectoralis muscle on the pectoralis branch if you want and we're uh, again doing this as a free flap uh, hooking it in here but if it didn't reach i mean it, it didn't reach i didn't expect it to reach so we did that one as a free flap the donut site, uh, we do a little propeller flap, but I do a lot of those just to, so we don't have to skin graft in these areas. And then you have to do a bunch of work. So here we're working on the upper lip and the lower lip. Uh, we're gonna defat this in segments. So all this fat comes out, even with primary thinning. And this is what we want. We wanna get that curve on the lower lip. Still kind of bulgy on the bottom as it contours. So we come back a couple weeks later, lift up and get rid of the fat on the bottom, getting a little bit better. You can see there's always a problem with the smile of it being tight, but the rest of her expressions are significantly improved. And there we are one year later. And then we're going to do a little bit more. So we want to get this compressed in more. And we want to deal with the Cupid's bow, which is not quite perfect. So we're going to sort of fix that, get rid of these poochy uh, little fat bands there, and tighten up that a little bit, and do a little scar fat flap to pull in this lower lid lip. Bring that down, bring that up. And there we go uh after another year or so not perfect but better than what we were now i said i don't like tissue expansion on flaps uh but i do a lot of come on donor sites this kid had a patchwork quilt of a face many years ago came to me and i didn't know how to deal with that uh he was 18 almost 18 years old i put a tissue expander in his posterior lateral skull way back here uh, and then was going to harvest a temporal parietalis fasciculus flap to make a a little goatee. So here we excise the aesthetic unit, uh, and we're putting the flap in. Fortunately, the vessels had a split, so I could split part of his mouth the first day, and uh, then a week later divide the rest of it. The great advantage of this is that there's no donor site because the expanded flap 
basically close that. These flaps are very, very nice. Any hair bearing flap, the only thing I would warn you is if the patient has to stay hair bearing, if he doesn't, you have to do a number of operations to thin these because these flaps tend to be thick. Once again, you want to compare to where you were. Ideally, you compare to normal. Our goal is not necessarily to make beautiful people, to make people function beautifully. And sometimes it just requires relatively small manipulations. Sometimes it requires relatively large overhauls. And sometimes it's not attainable. And plastic surgery, you should always remember, is a battle between blood supply and beauty. And it's in burn reconstruction is a battle between favorable and unfavorable scars in addition to the battle between psychological and physical scars. Thank you very much. Take some questions, have a little time for discussion, I hope. And I also have to acknowledge the residents who can't do anything without, and Tom Krizik, my mentor, teacher, and friend. Thank you. Wow. Larry, thank you so much. Your talks definitely never disappoint. Uh, Any time we hear your, your talks, it's really all about First of all, the, the principles of plastic surgery um, and also uh, about persistence. I think that uh, many of your talks uh, um, from the disasters of the master series to all your head and neck reconstructions uh, to even the best case and best saves that you have won over the years and including this is really all about never giving up um, and, and continuing to try to improve things, even if it's uh, you know, means additional operations over the next few, few years. So I really want to congratulate you on that. I think in, in many ways, your, your, your practice is really what plastic surgery is all about. I mean, I think um, it basically it's where the entire field comes together from the acute care of the burn patients to the burn reconstruction, um, to local flaps, to microsurgery, and then ultimately about aesthetics and function. So it's really where everything comes together. And I think I saw a lot of parallels between um, what you're doing, for example, in the neck and what we do in the hand with regards to contractures. Obviously, the stakes are much higher for you in the neck because if your PIP is contracted in one finger, it's obviously one finger that's affected. Um, but uh, but it's something that, that I, I noted a lot of similarities to. Now, in the hand, we do a lot of contracture releases, but we have the advantage of being able to splint, being able to pin temporarily, um, to maintain the position while things are healing. Um, I imagine that's a bit of a challenge when you're operating uh, in the neck or in the axilla or parts where they're a little bit more difficult to maintain position. Do you have any tricks to that um, when you do resurface these difficult areas like the neck? That's, that's why I really, especially with the unpredictable contracture and elastic recoil, if I can, I try to stage it where I'll get, I'll release it put it in place, then I can use a splint, I can use pressure, I can use a whole bunch of stuff, I don't have to worry about. Pressure on grafts are good, pressure on flaps are bad, right? right. So if I can get it in position where then I don't have to, then I can excise that, get a little bit better, and then put a flap on it, I think you're better off uh, than trying to put a flap right away uh, because then it just ends up being a big bulgy thing and you get to contract or anyway, you can't hold them up, you can't position them. Right. I've tried I've, over the years. I've tried external fixators and stuff like that, but that that's get really cumbersome. Uh, I've yeah. done uh, you know the neurosurgery uh, uh, what do you call pins and and traction. The, the halo. I mean, yeah. Yeah, halo. I mean, there's a host of things to do, but typically it's best to, especially the really bad ones, is release them, uh, get them in position with a graft or an allograft or integra or something and then go back and do your final resurfacing and people mm -hmm. that have not bad necks like that kid that I did the radio forum on there his he didn't have problems with range of motion so i just do that right away mm -hmm. but if you have problems with range what you want i think position them first uh yeah. before you're gonna put your final resurfacing on just because you can't use you know, if you're not going to use external fix them, you can't use pins and then you need the pressure, then you'll lose your flaps. Right, exactly. Um, now, what are your thoughts on Integra and are you using a lot of that? Or if so, where are you using it more? You know, um, I use it functionally. 
it gets me out of some trouble. I don't think it's as good as everybody says it is. It's not very good aesthetically. Matter of fact, I think in a lot of cases it's worse. Somehow they, these graphs end up being drier in my experience. Uh, they still contract, not quite, quite someplace between a full thickness and a, uh, a split graph. So it's not the most wonderful thing in the world, but it does get you out of some stuff if you're in a little hypovascular area or on these kids that have no skin left. On that kid with the, that I've been following for 25 years now, who I took care of when he was two years old this big, and the skin's, you have to release him. The, all we have is the top of his head and the bottom of his feet to get grafts from. So we release him, I put Integra on, and then do super thin grafts on that, and it, it helps up. Um, I think the important thing to recognize in burn reconstruction is if there's many times we're grafting on deep dermis, right? Because the indication for grafting is, is deep dermal or full thickness graft. Many people, especially if it's a really large burn, if it's below the dermis already, the only reason to save the fat is for aesthetics, and so we'll excise down a fascia. Um, if you have dermis, you should not, you can assume that your flap physiology, uh, vascularity is the same. You're just going to move a scarred or a skin grafted flap. If you have, and, and in the normal dimensions, if you don't have dermis, but you have graft on fat, you still can do the same thing. But I think the difference is you probably can move one perforosome or angiosome rather than two, mm -hmm. just because you don't have that subdermal right. plexus. I've also, we have a series actually of previously excised down a fascia with grafting where I've done a reverse rate of forum this is again, 30 years ago. And, but I did it myself. So I knew exactly what the anatomy was. And if you leave a little loose realist stuff on the fascia, you can then move that as a flap that had been previously grafted as well, which works very nicely. Right. Because again, you have no donor site, you just regraft your donor sites and they look the same. But I think just, just to remember that you have those flap availabilities in the burn patient, uh, you just have to think about how you're going to close them and things like that. And that everybody has memory. So you cut into something and it pops open. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, and speaking of flaps, I think burns represents a, a particular challenge in that, you know, in a, in a trauma, basically, once you go outside the zone, you are usually okay with your subcutaneous veins. So, for example, the cephalic or the basilic system in the arm, uh, and so on and so forth. In burns, obviously, many times your subcutaneous veins may be injured in the thermal injury. Do you have any modalities that you use routinely, such as imaging uh, technologies and ultrasound, or maybe a venous phase of an, angi of an angiogram to try to figure out ahead of time what veins you have available? Any tricks there for us? Um, again, if you're dealing with your own patients, <laughs> Uh, you try to be conscious. When I do excisions, even down in fascia, I, I try to save as many superficial veins as I can. Because you're not, you're frequently not excising because mm -hmm. the fat's dead. It's just because it's not reliable. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I just don't use superficial veins. I mean, if I'm doing free flap, I'll just use deeper veins. I, you know, if you, right. I, I do not, I do no imaging for anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. I close my eyes, use the force, and you say that's where the vessel should be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it works. But the, and if you, if you have a surprise and you find another superficial vessel that you didn't count on, that's a bonus. But you should know where all the vessels are. Uh, you should know what's available. You need, you need plan A, plan B, and you just go yeah. for it. I, I find imaging uh, in my hands not particularly helpful. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's... Uh... Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, we, we find ourselves at the Bunky Clinic oftentimes in a position where we're doing burn reconstructions um, in, in patients who have been treated elsewhere, and now it's been two years later and their hands contracted or all the way up the arm. And so I think you're right. If, if it's your patient, um, that's probably the best way because you're taking care of them from day one, so you know exactly the landscape there. Um, um, I, Greg, before we get to you, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions from our friends at Ganga Hospital? Absolutely. Great. So I want to welcome our friends at Ganga Hospital. Um, obviously, as we know, a, a, a very, very busy reconstructive hospital, including a very large burn unit. And our dear friend Hari Venkatramani is asking about um, lasers and, and at what point in the healing process you prefer to begin 
doing laser treatments. Um, obviously, we know that scars continue to mature for you know, at least up to a year or so and continue to contract after that. So any pearls there? Well, no, I am a skeptical believer. I'm old okay. school. I just hired a new young guy to do my lasers. <laughs> so okay. I think we really don't know. People are using it early. One of the reasons on that one girl that I sent to the Scott Holtman, he yeah. is considered one of the gurus in the United States at least. And I wasn't impressed. Uh, I also have Jerry Gardner, who's a world leader in Chicago and from dermatology. I'm not impressed on what they're able to do with the scars. I can do a Z-plasty uh, and get the same result. Or I have a series of patients, which is a whole nother talk of all this magic that I'm doing and all it is is time and pressure. Uh, and it looks the same. So the problem is nobody's doing half a phase. No, right. Nobody's, because we really don't know it's something that changes anyway. Mm -hmm. And you release, you release a neck, you release an extrinsic contractor, all of a sudden the rest of the scars are gonna get better. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know if you, you remember, there's a paper, I was gonna bring it up, JJ Longacre. Uh, not your long acre, or Stanford long acre, I don't know if he's related, but it was his intralesional Z-plasties. Mm -hmm. They showed collagenase in the urine. I mean, it was like you, re you release, you do a Z-plasty in the middle of a scar and everything gets soft. And in kids, mm -hmm. you put tissue expanders in and you see all of a sudden a scar <clears> someplace <throat> else gets soft. Uh, I, I think there are hormonal things that are happening. I think there's a lot of stuff we totally don't understand. Mm -hmm. I think lasers are really, really good because patients love them. And patients right. think that they're good, and it's a great business model. <laughs> uh, no question about it. Yeah. Whether or not we know enough as to when and what, I don't know. The main guys that I trust is Scott and, and uh, what's his <clears> name? <throat> uh, Donlin, Matt Donlin from Boston, who, who hates flaps, who thinks I'm crazy, <laughs> and does everything with lasers and Z-plasties. And we go down all the time at, at meetings, but uh, he he, had, he he's on the right track, I think. He he knows what he's doing. He's doing very carefully, also, um, so that at least they try to track. And hopefully, over time, we'll have a little bit more information. But I think yeah. internationally, people are using it, looking at it more carefully as well. Mm -hmm. Got it, uh, and Greg. Uh, uh, Greg, if you're there, do you want to go ahead and uh, make your comment or, or question? Sure, Th Larry. Thanks so much. You're, you're Every time I listen to you, I learn something and have new ideas for, for patient care. I, I really love it. A um, couple things. One is has to do with um, serial debriding versus uh, trying to flap uh, patients earlier than um, we, uh, you know, we both grew up through the, when Godina came out with his landmark article about trying to do things within uh, 72 hours. And we kind of went through that phase in the 90s and actually got burnt several times where we felt like we, and maybe we're dealing with crush injuries more rather than burns and the, the thermal injuries. We don't see a lot of electrical injuries, but they seem, seem to be a different, completely different animal. Uh, I don't know. Do you have some idea, some advice as to when you feel it's kind of ready and you don't get burnt by covering something that's, uh, you know, evolves and dies underneath the flap? So number one, dead muscle is only a problem if it gets infected. Otherwise, just fibrosis. Uh, put charred muscle and charged tendon stuff gives you a lot of foreign body stuff that you want to, you want to get rid of. Debridement is clearly an art. And the most senior person should be doing it, not the most junior, which frequently happens. Correct. Uh, yeah. And you need to get it so that, you know, uh, it is as clean as a whistle and you have to have reliable coverage. So if you cover it and you lose a centimeter, same thing with the radiated wound, right? If you cover it, you lose a centimeter and all of a sudden you let, leave a, an opening to get into, so things don't stick, things don't, you're, you're done. But if you can debride all the dead stuff and this marginal stuff and you can get a flap reliably, sometimes you need giant flaps, that's the problem, reliably sealed, where it's a muscle flap or skin flap or fascial flap or whatever, it, it's it's pretty amazing. And the thing we know is in trauma, it's a little bit different than um, electrical, electrical and thermal and all this. Those wounds are sterile when they come in, typically. 
unless they rolled around in the in the farm when they after they came off the. So that they, it doesn't take a lot to get them clean. I mean, they devitalize and then some dead stuff. But you decompress them, you leave all your tendons, leave all your nerves, and get them covered in a couple of days. I mean, if you wait. So the question is, is the tissue dead, but you don't recognize it? Or is it that by leaving it exposed, it's dying? And if you go the analogy of burn surgery, is go to Jenzenkovich. Remember Zora Jenzenkovich, 1970s from Yugoslavia, very similar to where Marco is. And she's mm. the one that showed that if you tangentially excise and close right away, you save that zone of stasis. So it used to be everybody excised, it bled so much, they waited the next day or two, went back, and the next layer is dead, and they had to excise again. And mm -hmm. she showed that in extremities, if you excised it on the tourniquet, you put a graft on right away, burrito dressing on. And she revolutionized the world of, of thermal skin grafting. And I and I use the same concept mm -hmm. with flaps and these electrical injuries or these other crush injuries. I think the key is the art of debridement, the accuracy of debridement, and being correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you remember Jim May's article way back when, when he was looking at uh, osteomyelitis, you know, with he had pre flaps and in, in two groups, and he had short antibiotics in one and long antibiotics the other. And, and the only ones that re he had one recurrence in both, and they each had sequestrum because he missed a piece of bone. Mm -hmm. they to take it out. So I think the problem is not missing a piece. And if you're not sure, then delay, you know, do it again. But if you're if you're pretty comfortable and you think you can get it done, I think the more you wait, the more fibrosis you get, the more infection you get. Um, and you know you just have to deal with whatever logistics stuff you have. So I mean, it's not an exact number. <laughs> I was trying to do it emergently for many years, and that drove me crazy. So it did. If you do it over two, three, four days, I mean, you usually can get it done. Yeah. Great. And then, is there something special with these thicker free? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, thicker full thickness graphs. Yeah, it is amazing. About? It is amazing. You know, it again, it's it's analogous. I think a lot of to the to low beans fast, but you. Yeah, I was taught you take that fat off and you sort of make it a thick, full, a thick uh, split thickness graph, right? You take yeah. a little bit of the garments off, all that fuzzy white stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, when I do that, and I look at it in a week or 10 days, it's always purple and yucky and stuff. And on these, you, I mean, you, you, if you use your loops, you can see this, there's a thin white layer right mm -hmm. below the, the dermis and there's these tiny little vessels in it. And you just leave a tiny bit of fat that you need to, but you try not to avoid. And then you have what the concept is, it's true inosculation. So the question is when you have a graft, we you know, we teach everybody, right, there's a bibition, then there's an osculation. And, and then you look at the, your graft and you say, what kind of osculation in this white shit I'm putting down, right? Right. But if you see these little vessels, I mean, it's, I think it's truly happening. Uh, and it happens very, very fast. So, and do you uh, compress them with the bolster? Do you compress them down I, like you I, did at full? I rarely use bolsters for almost anything. I number one, if I'm doing a convexity, mm -hmm. I usually just have a piece of plastic or something to hold it on. There's no point in pulling it up, right? Got it. So you pull down. If I have a concavity, sometimes I'll put something in to fill, but I, I don't. I don't think you need a bolster bolsters as most people consider it. I think you just but need one layer that's going to keep it. But you're compressed, like a free flap, we don't compress. Skin grafts, we compress. Is this somewhere in between? Yeah, I don't really compress too much skin grafts. You don't have to compress skin grafts. I mean, we do it frequently, but we don't have to. I mean, I frequently, if I have a, a sensitive area, put a skin graft on, the best thing you do is don't do anything. Put a little nylon mesh, glue it around, watch it. And uh, if, the, if you're a compliant patient, then you'll do much better than trying to put dressings on, which will, or if you're good to go, if you're in an area that moves, like a scapula, stuff like that, much better off not putting a dressing on it uh, if you can get somebody not to lay on it. But don't you worry about uh, blood collecting under the graft and then the graft not taking because of that? Well, if your graft is adherent to your bed, mm -hmm. they move together, it's not a problem. The problem is when they move separately. So if you graft, one of the problems with bolsters sometimes is your graft gets stuck to your bolster, mm -hmm. and then your bed moves, and then you get your problem. Right. So, yeah, you know, and if you're looking at it, if you see some blood, you make a little hole and you drain it. Right. 
Um, we have a uh, question from one of my partners, Walter Lin. Walter, are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Is my mic working this yeah. time? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Um, so, Dr. Gottlieb, thank you. That was a that was a really wonderful talk, and I want to congratulate you on your phenomenal results. Um, I just had a couple questions. Uh, I noticed most of your examples were secondary contractor releases that you did, um, who were referred from other institutions. So I was wondering if these patients were yours initially, um, would you have done flaps acutely, or would you still um, get them healed up? and then come back secondarily after they've reached soft tissue equilibrium, um, such as when they're referred um, secondarily? So uh, it really depends, but there's no question that we've been doing less and less reconstruction on my own patients. And if you're conscious, and it depends, I really believe, I don't know if there's any general surgeons in the audience, but if you have a general surgery run plus a uh, burn unit versus a plastic surgery run burn unit, you have a totally different perspective on importance of outcomes, on aesthetics, and on so many different things, whether it be hand function, whether it be face, whether it be neck. Uh, again, the thing of not meshing graphs, um, uh, the big thing that's changed, the reason why now we can save 90% burns and we couldn't 30 years ago is because we're excising them every day in the first week. The reason people look better is because we get them, if you get a wound that closes in a week, whether by a biologic or some magic, there's no scar, there's just pigment. If you wait three weeks, 90% of them have heavy scars. And so if you prioritize getting your wounds closed sooner, uh, the client showed this in uh, what do you call it, in Seattle in, in spatial stuff. You, you just get them closed sooner, and they're gonna have less scars, and then they're gonna have less contractures. So, you know, if you, the, you typically we're not gonna release them earlier with, uh, I mean, um, as far as flaps go, unless they need it. Um, you do the same stuff, but you do it in a better way, if you will. If you lose your graft for some reason or another, or have a complication, you can have a problem. Right. I think those, those are very good points. And and um, I, had, I had a second question. So I think you and Dr. Safa had alluded to it earlier in terms of going to deeper blood vessels. But I was wondering, um, for instance, say you have a you know um, dorsal hand and forearm burns. Um, you need to cover the joints. Um, you mentioned going to deeper blood vessels. So have you had any problems within the zone of injury going to deeper vessels or do you, do you still have to go um, traditionally out of the, the zone of injury as we think well, about it? I told my recipient vessels, when I say deeper vessels. Um, I, I've, yeah, I have a whole separate talk on, on perforated flaps and, and burns and frostbite and, and um, it's interesting because everybody, everybody's very interesting because they, everybody's good, apparently it's had a lot of problems, whether you call it zone of injury or something else with using these tissues, or these vessels. I've not, I don't think there's a major zone of injury in a thermal burn. Electrical injuries there are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's again, being able to evaluate those vessels. You, you can get secondary blowouts of, you know, uh, forearm vessels and they've been injured and stuff, and you just have to be careful. But it's, um, if you just have a regular thermal burn that, that's down to, whether it's contact or anything else that's down to a joint, why should the vessels around there be bad? I mean, you know, you go a couple centimeters away. I mean, I think it's the same thing as anything else, right? If you can tease the veins and the arteries away from the soft tissue easily, you're out of the zone of injury. Right. Perfect, right? thank you. I mean, yeah. I mean Thrombosis and, and zone of injury is all inflammatory. So if you're having a hard time and you're cutting it out, you're probably in the wrong place. Maybe you'll have to get away with it, but ideally you should be in loose areola stuff around your arteries and your veins. Yep. Makes perfect Great. sense. Thanks. Well, Larry, thank you so much again for being with us. Um, you're always educating us and inspiring us to, to stick with it and do everything we can to improve our patients' lives. and 
and and I just want to thank you again on behalf of everyone who was on this um, webinar. We hit uh, 70 at one point from people all, all over the world, actually. Um, so I want to thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Hope so. Stay well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Be well.